Mun. My name is Mark Sabatella, the director of the Master and Musicore School and Community. Welcome to the Musicore Cafe. So this is my weekly series where I talk about making music with Musicore. I pick a topic usually to talk about and talk about that, take your questions. And I drink coffee. So, um, yes, this uh, program is brought to you by Mastering MuseScore, and I pinned to the top the uh, community site. It's uh, free to join the community. You'll also see the instructions for how to join the Mastering MuseScore school. We have a now. We have, uh, you know, courses available and an all-access membership that I highly recommend. So, uh, that's my story. Um, so today's topic I want to talk about is orchestral music, and that's because I did a presentation yesterday uh, for uh, an organization called um, uh, the Major Orchestra Librarians Association, MOLA. And yes, the link that I posted at the top of the chat is the best way to get to the cafe. I think it is. Um, that part of, part of why I created this community was to kind of... Uh, coalesce everything into one spot. And so if you're on the community site, you will see MuseScore Cafe on the left and then watch. And you can just uh, click here and this will always be showing you the current episode. Like if I press play here, that is the best way to get to the cafe. There you go. You can uh, watch live there, um, but you can also check out past episodes and then uh, continue the conversation here afterwards so that after the chat, you can uh, you know, talk about whatever else uh, you want to be talking about that comes up. So uh, yeah, highly recommend that as just the, the kind of home for whatever kinds of discussions we might be having. So anyhow, I did this presentation for the major orchestra, major Orchestra Librarians Association uh, about MuseScore, co-presented with Peter Jonas. And uh, we kind of talked about who's also a developer of MuseScore, and he is the community manager is his actual title. And Peter Jonas is uh, responsible uh, in, uh, well, yeah, he is uh, the number one person responsible for the OpenScore project. If you're not familiar with the OpenScore project, let me actually show you a little bit of that. Um, OpenScore is a whole series of scores that are uh, saved on, on uploaded to MuseScore.com, but not random scores uploaded by random people, but instead are ones that were kind of professionally uh, edited. So they might have been worked on by random people. Uh, and of course, it's also an older version of MuseScore that was used to create it. And so now there's all sorts of little issues that might show up. But I'm going to import this one despite, let's see what errors there are. Oh, there's only one, uh, one bad measure, 403. I'm going to ignore that error and go ahead and uh, let the uh, Tchaikovsky uh, 1812 import, and they all get this. Uh, so this was created in MuseScore 2. So yeah, quite old. It was 2.1. So this was created like five, six, probably six or seven years ago. And they all have uh, this uh, cover art that was sort of uh, computer-assisted generation that actually represents the content of the score in according to some algorithm or other. And then, uh, yeah, the actual editing of the music was done, um, you know, really looking at a, an established edition. I think there was one particular IMSLP edition. And since we're talking about orchestral music, if you're not familiar with IMSLP, let me actually um, just... Yeah, I don't really want that. I just want general IMSLP. And uh, this is a site where there's all sorts of uh, historic uh, sheet music available. So I'm going to post this link into the chat. And so these are actual scans of the actual published uh, scores for tons and tons of music. Um, there's a terrible what? Uh, is there a problem that I need to know about? Technical issue? That happens. Uh, okay, uh, I, don't, I don't see it on my problem, on my site, uh, on my phone. Um, so, uh, 
What was I saying? Oh yeah, so this is a, a, a site that has all this uh, sheet music available, just tons and tons of sheet music. Uh, if I type in 1812, probably, oh, look at that. Yeah, it uh, searches the uh, IMSLP site, and then you will see here the complete score from IMSLP, and uh, I'm actually... I should be logged in. I shouldn't have gotten that disclaimer, but I guess I do. So this is like published sheet music and it's old enough. It's it's all public domain and they only host public domain scores. And then so OpenScore is a project on uh, that's kind of part of MuseScore that Peter Jonas is in charge of in which they've taken music and it's not just orchestral music. There's piano music, choral music, all sorts of different music, but it's all public domain music that's been entered into MuseScore and, you know, fairly painstakingly edited for correctness against a particular edition. Um, uh, you know, and I think they actually use IMSLP as one of their resources. So that's a, a way to actually get at some music. So if I go to musescore.com uh, and search for open score. What will come up are all these editions, and here's the one uh, that I just opened there, the 1812 Overture. And so you can download these from uh, from musescore.com. And so there's a lot of great music available already, um, and I'm just pointing that out because that's what I'm going to be using for some demonstrations here. Is I'm going to show you some music uh, uh, from Open Score, and I'm going to do some things. So yeah, I'm going to guess that uh, yeah, Graham, you must have something going on because it seems fine on my system too. So probably you do have two tabs open. That's uh, a good, a very good guess there. Um, so. Uh, well, if let's let's uh, take a look at this uh, score in MuseScore. I haven't actually opened this one in MuseScore in a long time. And one thing I know from experience is that when I try to run a big score in MuseScore while I'm broadcasting for the cafe, it's very hiccupy. And so, uh, you know, normally I can get good playback, but not while I'm broadcasting, unfortunately. Um, but let me um, let me just uh, start the score. Let's try that again. So yeah, y'all don't know that part, right? But y'all know the uh, the part by the time we get to the stuff around here, maybe. <laughs> system can't keep up still. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, so this is the, the whole uh, overture entered into here. And so I want to talk about some of the issues that come up when you're uh, creating orchestral music. And there's a lot of things that come up and they come up over and over again. So the first thing I want to do is create a new score. So I'm going to control N and create uh, my orchestra piece. Um, and the only reason I'm typing a title in there is so something reasonable shows up in the uh, on the tab there. Uh, and now I can go to oh yes, let me let me do two things that I, I uh, occasionally remember to do but often don't. One is highlight my mouse cursor, and the other is show you my keystrokes. So that was Control N was to create a new score. Um, under orchestral, you'll see there's three templates here. Classical orchestra actually refers to like the orchestra of Haydn, sort of the early classical period, smaller orchestra. Symphony orchestra is what we mostly associate with orchestras now, the sort of modern orchestra. And then there's also a string orchestra, which is just the strings template. So I'm going to pick the symphony uh, orchestra template and just, uh, oh, I can't even spell orchestra. Look at that. Let's um, spell orchestra better. Okay, uh, there we go. So when you create your orchestra piece from the template, you'll see it's got all these instruments already entered, bar lines already connected, brackets already set up and all. There's a number of things uh, about this template that, um, hey, Joanne, glad you made it. Um, so uh, 
there's a number of, of things that you might want to customize right off the bat. So if you go, I'm going to press I, or you can go to edit instruments, you'll see all the places where you can like add staves, remove staves, so you can add additional instruments. If you don't have two oboes, you only have one oboe that you're writing for, you can delete one. Or and this is one of the things I actually want to show you. I'll show it to you actually with the flutes. I'm going to delete one of the flutes. <clears throat> and the reason I'm going to delete it is I want to put both my flutes on one staff to save room. So now that there's only one flute staff, um, I can see now that it's still called flute one. So I'm going to double click that to get into staff properties here and change the name to flute, flutes one and two. And the part name, uh, this part name here, I think is what shows up in the mixer. It's a little deceptive. It's also the name that will show up on a part when you first generate the parts, but I'm gonna do something different. So I'm gonna call it flute one and two and then see what happens here. So I now have one staff for both my flutes. Well, one of the things I want to show you, because some people I've noticed haven't really uh, <clears throat> wrapped their brains around parts yet. Parts are really nice in MuseScore. If I go to File, Parts, and then click All Parts, it generates parts for everything there. And there's that name, Flute 1 and 2, that shows up for that part. I'm not going to use that part, though. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do instead. So if I put some notes on here, and then maybe go down to the next staff, just putting some notes on here so they're not empty, so we can actually see what's going on. So here's my flute staff. There's oboe one, there's oboe two, there's clarinet one, clarinet two, etc. So right now, I have one staff for both of my flutes. Let me go ahead and put in I'm going to use multiple voices. I'm going to switch to voice two and enter some more notes. I'll make them half notes. And I will zoom in. So uh, you can see now I have flutes one and two on the same staff. And if I go to the part, it looks like that also. But what I can do is when I go back to my score now, <clears throat> if I say file, parts. And this time, instead of saying I want all parts, because that does everything automatically, I'm going to just generate a single part. And this is going to be for flute one only. And I'm going to select the flutes one and two instrument in the score. But over here, on the lower right, I'm going to tell it I only want voice one. And I will turn off the other voices. I guess while I was there, I should have added a flute two part, right? So I'm going to go back over there, and this time I'll add a single part and call it flute two. And again, I'm going to use that flutes one and two instrument, but this time I'm only going to take voice two. So now, if we come over and look at those parts that I just created, so the vo voice one had the C quarter notes, voice two has the A half notes. Let's take a look. Here we go, flute one is the C quarter notes, flute two is the A half notes. And notice they've actually been moved into voice one on the part, so you don't see this weird stem down thing that doesn't, uh, that doesn't belong there. So anyhow, this feature, it's relatively new, this ability to generate split parts uh, like that from a single uh, staff. It actually came out when MuseScore 3 came out, which was like, you know, two and a half years ago. I think I lose track of time sometimes. Could have been three years ago for all I know. But um, it was, uh, it didn't work very well when it first came out. There were enough bugs that we really couldn't recommend it. And over the years, we fixed enough of the bugs where as of like maybe 3.5 or so, I would consider it usable. It's still a bit limited in that it requires you to actually completely separate the parts like that. Like I have voice one and voice two here. If I have some other measures, let me uh, go to uh, actually the score. 
if I have some measures where the flutes are supposed to have the same part, like maybe they're both supposed to go, you know, have these eighth notes uh, that they're both supposed to have, that is only going to show up on the flute one part. If I go to the flute two part, they're not there because I only entered them into voice one. So I'd have to enter those into voice one and voice two to get them to show up. And yeah, I could make the voice two ones invisible in the score. Probably I could probably play games with that, but it, it is a little extra work. So I would only recommend that if your parts are actually, you know, different enough that it feels like it's going to be worthwhile. I'm coming back to the uh, um, uh, file, the, the parts dialog here because I kind of want to move that flute up to the top. Could I have done those together? Probably not. I probably can't select more more than one thing and move them together. No. All right. And so now I'll move flute two up to the top also. Right below. There we go. Okay. So now they're a little easier for me to find right next to the uh, right next to the score. Okay. So, um, so let's see. Um, some of the things there, there's all sorts of kind of random things that I want to talk about, but by all means, ask questions. If they're questions that in any way relate to orchestral music so much, the better. If not, I'll get to them as I can. But, uh, Often, you know, orchestral music is, you know, a lot of the same issues that come up with any kind of music come up in orchestral music, but there's unique things that come up, especially in orchestral music. So here's one of them. Let's take a look at that Tchaikovsky piece. Uh, look at what's going on uh, here. All these instruments have essentially the same thing. Here, uh, I guess flute one and two are sufficiently different um, that he elected to go with two separate staves. Plus, this was created in music score two. We didn't have that whole split feature then. Um, and then if you look at the lower woodwinds uh, and the, the horns, they've just got half notes. And so... But realistically, the parts here, uh, let's, let's actually focus maybe on the half notes. It'll be easier to talk about. The, uh, the half note parts are, you know, everyone's got the same rhythm here. They're just different pitches. And they all have the same dynamics and all. So one of the things that MuseScore lets you do is enter a part once, duplicate it on other staves, and then just change the pitches. So let's say I wanted to do that. Let's say I wanted to enter... Um, some notes that were on just the clarinets and horns. It started on clarinet two, I think. I'm not going to worry too much about copying exactly. Clarinet, oh, C1. What is C? Clarinet, clarinet, something that starts with a C, and then FAG is fagote, it's a uh, bassoon. So what is that C, I wonder? It's an English horn? Cora anglais. There we go, English horn. Um, that makes sense. Uh, so it's uh, cor anglais. Anglais, I don't know how to pronounce French. I'm just guessing. You all know that. Um, so anyhow, I'm going to go to uh, my uh, bassoons and just enter some half notes here. Except I'll make it a half note by pressing W. And another half note. And then maybe I've got some, maybe I need a crescendo over here. I'll enter my crescendo there, typing the less than sign, right? Makes a crescendo. I don't know if that's right or right or right way around or backwards for you, but that looks like a crescendo to me. That looks like a diminuendo, but maybe you're seeing it backwards. So I've got these, uh, I've got this part entered and maybe I'll put a dynamic marking at the end. Say it's going to forte. And I'll put one at the beginning. So, uh, all right, I have my part here that's something like what Tchaikovsky uh, wanted. If I want everyone to have basically have half notes, the, the, the rest of the bassoons and the horns, 
to all have the same thing and I'll just include the trumpets in here also. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select all the instruments that I want duplicated across. So I clicked up uh, the first at the top there with the bassoon, the bassoon part that I actually entered and then shift clicked uh, the last measure of that passage for the bottom staff that I want included. Now I'm going to go to explode tools explode. Bam. It just copied that into all the other parts. If I had actually entered chords onto the bassoon staff, let me undo this. If I had actually entered the full chord here, trying to make this resemble music. Uh, well, actually I need two G's on this. I'm just making stuff up. Pay no attention to me. All right, uh, you get the idea. I'm entering full chords here. And now if I do that same thing of selecting the passage and going to Tools Explode, it actually takes those chords and divvies the notes up. So if you have the foresight to actually enter the whole chord onto the top staff, Explode will split them up like that. But if there's any staves left over, like here, these uh, the trumpet just got the bottom note. Uh, it sort of ran out of notes. And um, uh, so we have a C, G, E, which is, it's transposed, right? So it looks like a B. Let's go to concert pitch mode, shall we? Concert pitch mode. So now I'm seeing everything at written pitch. That's an E, that's a low C. Now, of course, at written pitch, treble clef is not an, is not a, a wise choice for uh, treble for uh, the clef. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to change the horn clefs while I'm in concert pitch mode. Can I select them both? I think if I control click them and then change their clef to, I'm going to make it be the treble clef transposed an octave. That'll be a pretty good choice. Yeah, change them both. Nice. Um, and But it only makes that change while you're in concert pitch mode. And then when I turn concert pitch off, they turn back into regular treble clefs. So that's a kind of convenient feature. All right. So uh, you see my original chord was C, G, E, C, top and bottom. The leftover instruments just got the same pitch, and that's crazy too low. What I'm going to do now is use what's called repitch mode. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to go into node input mode, but instead of actually entering new pitches, like having to choose rhythms, actually this would have been more impressive had I used some other... Uh, um, so let me actually delete all this, and this time I'm going to make this actually be more rhythmically interesting. There we go. Now this is a slightly more interesting passage that I'm going to copy to everyone else with tools explode. And so now everyone has that same rhythm. So may, now I have an opportunity to enter new pitches. So I'm going to actually come over here to the horns and I'll go into node input mode, but I'm going to use the drop down next to it to change to repitch mode. This shortcut, Control Shift I, I can't remember. Boy, I wouldn't have picked that one myself. So I have a, I have to imagine that's actually the default shortcut for it because it makes no sense. <laughs> I wouldn't have picked it. I would have picked something that made sense. They just went with whatever uh, was whatever keys were available. I think. Um, so uh, in any case, when you're in repitch mode. Notice the icon now changes to this funny looking thing, a note with an arrow up and down instead of the letter N. Now, all I have to do is type letters and it will replace the existing pitches with those letters. So watch, I can replace that with a G and I could say, oh no, I really want it down here. And then I can replace the next note with an F. And then a G, I'll just go back and forth, F, G, F, G, F, 
see that that's what I'm doing is as I'm typing the keys, I'm not having to pay attention to durations. It's using the existing durations, just replacing the pitches. I can go to the next staff and do the same thing. E, D, D, E, and so on. And so it's a way, if you know you're going to have a lot of parts that are basically the same in terms of their rhythm and they're same in terms of their dynamics and slurs or any other articulations and things, go ahead and enter it on the one staff, use explode to fill out the rest of the staves, then you can change the pitches. Or if you have the foresight to actually enter the chords to begin with, explode will actually get the pitches right for you. So that's like a, a I don't know, something that I find uh, useful. Um, so uh, let's see, there were a couple things there. Uh, I will absolutely, um, you know, take uh, questions about this or anything else because um, uh, this is all things that, um, yeah, uh, even if you're not writing for an orchestra, the idea of an ensemble in general, uh, you know, you might be needing to do those things. One of the other little tricks, and this one I mentioned to those of you who are on my mailing list, by the way, if you're not on my mailing list, uh, uh, go go to, here, let me go over to where my uh, thing is. Uh, if you go to the school site, it should nag you, master ring newscore.com. If you go to the school site there and then try to leave, it will... Uh, um, uh, it, it'll say, hey, you want to join the newsletter? And, and go ahead and do it, because I send out this weekly newsletter. It's kind of cool. Um, the, the newsletter has information about, uh, um, you know, the upcoming cafe and stuff, but it also, I just include some random tips and things. And so one of them that I just put in this week, so some of you have seen this, some of you probably haven't, has to do with entering uh, markings like dynamics. So let me make some changes here. I'm going to, oops, I need to go back to regular note input mode. You have to remember that after you've been in note in repitch mode, you're going to have to go back to regular note input mode if you want to get any work done, um, any other kind of work done. Well, say that I want to put a piano um, and someone else has 16th notes. Say I want to put a, a, a dynamic marking, mezzo piano, on the first note. Well, let's give one person a rest. Well, it's going to be really hard to make a selection that's just literally the first note. Because if I press this and press shift down, it's already encompassed the first two notes of the top staff because it was eighth notes, right? And uh, it's just, oh, hey, look at that. When I, when I shrunk it to, when I got down to the fourth staff, it actually shrank it down because it had a 16th note, but then I got to the next staff, it's got a whole rest, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to make a selection that's literally just the first note across all staves. And yes, you could control click each note one at a time to add that dynamic. But what I find that's actually pretty clever is add the dynamics first, because then you can easily make your vertical selection. I, I just took my empty measure and then shift down and I make that selection. And then I can come to my dynamics palette and enter my mezzo piano, then go back and enter my notes. So one of the things that I wonder right now is if there's some clever way to fix that after the fact, like I've forgotten. And I'm going to guess that if I was really clever, I could figure it out. But I'm not sure that it's going to work. But I'm going to try this anyhow. I'm going to select that whole passage and then cut into the clipboard. Control X. Now I'll come down here and enter my dynamic. I think what's going to happen if I come back here and paste, I think it's going to obliterate the dynamics. But first, we're going to find that out. Yeah, it obliterated the dynamics. Next, I want to try something else, though. I want to say, well, what if I uh use um this special command that says swap with clipboard all right now i have the dynamics in without you know now the dynamics are in my clipboard and i wonder if i paste those i don't know i i, I imagine there's some sort of tricky thing i could do with the selection filter i'm not going to try to figure that out but my guess is there would be a way to somehow merge those 
um, uh, if you've already entered the notes. But anyhow, I just wanted to show you the tip of enter dynamics before the notes, and then and then it's uh, easier. So uh, there's lots of things about uh, entering orchestral music that can be, uh, um, I don't know, unique, maybe. Uh, one of the things, let's uh, also go back to the instruments dialog. Notice at the top of the dialog, it says ordering orchestral. That's because MuseScore knows what orchestral score ordering is. So if I decide, you know what, I need that English horn, I open up the woodwinds tab, I don't see uh, English horn here, and that's fine. It's not a common enough instrument. But if I type and start to type that into the search box, I see English horn. When I double click it now, hopefully, yes, it knew. It's not common enough for it to show up under, under the common instruments by default, but it was common enough that it knows where to put it. You know, it knows that English horn goes between the oboe and the clarinet, or at least that's where it thinks it goes. Um, I actually might have thought it went between the clarinets and the bassoon, but I don't really know because I don't, I don't like for English horn that much. I guess that's probably the right place for it. And so it knows those sorts of things. But if you did want it uh, below the clarinets, I can just use the arrows here to move it below the clarinets. And now the ordering says it's orchestral customized because, yeah, I've customized it. And when I press OK, now I've got my uh, um, English horn in there. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, some some things about rearranging things. And also, similarly with brackets, it's it knows by default normal things that you might do with brackets. But you know, just because they're the normal things doesn't mean it's what you want to do. So let me go back to the uh, instruments dialog. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to go, if I go back to orchestral ordering, it'll actually rearrange things for me. When I click that, it's going to move the English horn back where it thinks it belonged, uh, right below the oboes. And I'm going to press OK. Um, so what I see here is that it added the English horn, but it didn't include it in a bracket with the oboe. And that's fine. That's probably correct. But what if it was like a player who was supposed to double? He was supposed to be, sometimes he plays a, a third oboe part, and then other times he switches to English horn. And you want to get that bracket to encompass that staff. Well, I can click that bracket. Actually, I think I double click the bracket. And it gives me a handle. And then I just drag the handle down and it will encompass that staff. So you can customize um, the arrangement of those brackets and add new ones and things if uh, you decided you actually wanted, oh, I don't know. You notice there's already, let me zoom out a bit, there's already one of uh, these sort of uh, angle bracket things, not angle bracket, but you know, the bracket with a hook on it that's connecting all of the woodwinds. Um, and that's pretty normal. But if you maybe wanted to connect, uh, let me move that oboe one back. Maybe I want the oboes connected with that bracket, but I want a different kind of bracket connecting the oboes and the horn. I can select the oboes and horn and then come to the brackets palette and give them, say, a curly brace. And now there's a curly brace there. Um, I'm not saying that's something you would actually want to do, but maybe this one here where it's just a vertical line that one might be appropriate. Curly braces are normally used only for piano or instruments that are more than one in more than one staff for the same instrument. The other kind of brackets are, I mean, this these are both oboes, but it's not one oboe player reading two staves. So usually the curly braces are only instruments where it's one player reading those two staves. I'm not going to claim it's 100% consistent about that, um, but I that's that is how I normally think of it. So um, yeah, winged winged bracket is how uh, how we jazz people would refer to what's going on with there. These are wings on that bracket. So uh, what else can I tell you here? Um, the idea of exploding is uh, really useful. It's let me let me actually show you something that you could do. Then let's go back to when I had. Uh, what did I do here? I had A, C, A, C. Mm -hmm. 
And what if I wanted to take this and sort of reproduce it on voice two, because I knew I wanted it to show up on the flute two part, right? Those eighth notes don't show up in voice two. Um, so because they're not there in voice two, uh, I, I want to get them there. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy that. Then I'm going to go to tools, voices, exchange voices one and two, which you may remember in cafe a few weeks ago, I defined a shortcut for it, which I've come to enjoy very much of tick one, two. So I'm actually going to use my fun shortcut. Let's actually go two measures, tick one, two. Whoa, apparently uh, that command crashed. You know what? I can totally believe that um, if you've generated split parts like I did, switching voices would, would uh, confuse MuseScore. So um, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Do I want to restore the session? Yeah, I might as well. So um, what size paper? So that's a really good question. Um, so I don't own a printer that can do it. I've thought about getting one when I was writing more orchestral music. I thought about getting it. So if you live in the United States, uh, the standard printers print what's called letter size paper, which is eight and a half by 11. What that really means is the printer is eight and a half inches wide, right? Or maybe it can literally go nine inches and go a little bit wider, but it's eight and a half inches wide that it can handle. Um, and then, you know, the 11 inch is the long width. So it, it only, the printer only has to be as wide as the narrower dimension of the paper, right? So uh, eight and a half by 11 is the standard size. The next size up that you, well, there's eight and a half by 14, right? Legal size. And those of you in Europe, you have your own sizes, A4, A3. I know that. I just can't speak to it as much. So eight and a half by 11, a standard letter size paper uh, printer will print a letter size paper and can also print legal paper because legal paper is not wider. It's just longer. The next common wider size that you will encounter is 13 by 17. Is that? Oh gosh, now I'm now I'm doubting. Eleven by seven. It's eleven by seventeen, right? Eleven by seventeen is the next wider size. I want to say, so you can buy eleven by uh, seventeen paper, but then you need a printer that can do eleven inches wide. What you will find is uh, eleven inches wide. You're not going to find a printer that does just eleven, but you will find ones that do thirteen, and therefore it can do eleven also. So in the United States, you can buy a thirteen-inch wide printer. It will just be called a wide format printer. And so you could buy yourself a wide a wide printer, and then buy yourself a supply of eleven by seventeen paper. It would be called tabloid paper, I believe, is what the term would be for it. Um, so that's a standard size. I, I in in uh, anywhere else in the world, some other size, and someone else who's done this, feel free to um, stick uh, stick names. Uh, you know, whatever. I guess A three is the next size bigger from A four. I don't know how it compares with that eleven by seventeen. Oh, actually, let's find out, shall we? Let's go to uh, format page settings, and I'm actually going to change from letter paper here to, uh, well, here's the tabloid there. Oh, ledger and tabloid, by the way, are the same size, except ledger is landscape format by default. Tabloid is uh, portrait format by default. So uh, this size here actually works pretty well. It's pretty big. You know, I professional orchestral uh, conductor scores are not actually that large. They're custom cut. but ones that are produced by, you know, students and, you know, uh, you know, individual composers, that's like the easiest size to get a hold of. You can go to your local copy shop and they probably have the 11 by 17 paper in shop, in store, in stock, and they probably have a wide format printer. So you don't have to buy the printer. You just go down to, in my case, Office Depot and, uh, they will and just bring a flash drive with my PDF that's set up for tabloid and they will happily print it for me after I sign a copyright waiver, uh, assuring them that this is either my music or public domain. So, um, 
so anyhow, the, the size is, let's see, 279 by 431 millimeters. If I go here to A3, yeah, 239, 4, yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's just different. I can switch the display to inches and see what that really is. It's, it's a little more than 11 by a little less than 17. So yeah, this is comparable to tabloid size. So that would probably be a good choice for um, people outside, uh, outside the States. So nine by 12 is not a size you would commonly use for the score uh, because it's not enough bigger than eight and a half by 11 to be useful for the score. Because even just to fit all these instruments, let me, let me go back to when it was a uh, uh, letter size. At letter size, these instruments all fit on the paper because they've been made tiny. The score, the the um, staff size here is only like uh, less than four millimeters tall. If you go to format, page settings, uh, the, um, oh, let's go back to millimeters. Uh, the, the staff size is only 0.94 millimeters. So four spaces tall is less than four millimeters. That's really tiny. Um, by going to a larger page size, so if I do go to the tabloid page size, I will be able to go with a larger uh, um, staff size and still fit on the page. So I don't know if this will literally fit. 1.5 might be a little. Yeah, it literally still fits. So now this is much more readable. So by going with the tabloid, you can actually do that. 9 by 12 won't be enough bigger to matter. But what you will find is that parts are printed on 9 by 12. And I, they, it's a little bigger than 8.5 by 11. And so it's a little easier to read. Frankly, I think one of the reasons they started going with 9 by 12 for parts is it makes it harder for the average person to photocopy. Because if your photocopier is limited to letter size, the 9 by 12 just barely won't fit. Realistically, most most uh, printers, these most uh, photocopiers are big enough for 9 by 12. And then they have a reduce option. So it doesn't really get you around anything. But yeah, 9 by 12 is common for parts. So um, yeah, so there, a print shop can do a lot of stuff uh, for you. So someone has a 36 inch wide. Wow, that's pretty impressive at work. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, so uh, yeah, so those are those are some great observations there. So yeah, the standard, first of all, there is no actual standard standard for uh, page size and uh, staff size, but actually MOLA, the um, the organization, the Modern or Orchestra Librarian Association uh, organization that I just uh, presented to, they have guidelines that they have published for, yeah, but this is like some random person's website. They must have it on their own website, no? Guidelines for Music, this is the one. Okay, so this is a resource that's actually fairly um, fairly uh, well-known, well-established. Um, so let me post that in there. Those are uh, guidelines for score preparation. And I see a question about opera. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so the um, here's the English version. Their guidelines are, you know, they're they're or they're professional orchestra librarians. They know a thing or two about this, and they are mostly interested in things like the parts because they want their parts to be readable by, uh, you know, musicians. So they they have some very specific guidelines about, um, you know, uh, cover pages and formatting. Minimum legible staff size for scores is four millimeters. So there you go. Their minimum is basically one millimeter staff space because a staff is four spaces tall, right? Five lines, four spaces. So they're saying the minimum is four millimeters. Realistically, you want bigger. Um, that's minimum. For parts, they're saying 7.5 millimeters. Well, what's 7.5 divided by four? I don't know. Um, let me divide for you. 7.5 divided by 4 equals 1.875. Is that right? 
Yeah, 1.875. That's larger than mu scores default. Mu scores default is uh, 1.75. 1.75 is basically uh, times four is seven millimeters. So they say, although seven millimeters may be readable for winds because they each have their own stand, it's less so for strings because strings, it's two people sharing one stand usually. And so the stand is a little further away and they're saying you want it a little bigger. So MuseCore's default is okay for solo instruments. But what they're saying is when you have multiple people sharing, you should produce parts that are a little larger. And that's like an interesting little guideline that, you know, probably most of us have never thought of before. But it's, um, uh, you know, these are all the kinds of guidelines that are in here. So it's really, really uh, good guidelines that are uh, good to pay attention to. All right. So as far as opera goes, um, I mean, uh, there's, um, you know, how do you write an opera? Well, that's a big topic there. But as far as the actual ordering of things, I think if I go into, I'm going to go back to the, the, cause I think this, the, my staff size here is now too big to fit any more staves comfortably. So I'm going to go back to format. Oh, by the way, notice this thing here where, uh, the page is full right now, right? The, the staves are all fitting on the page nicely, but they did before also. So in other words, when I had only one millimeter, it was actually less than one, but I'm going to go with one. When it was only one millimeter, it also filled the space. That's because MuScore as a 3.6 automatically spreads your staves out to fill the page even on an orchestra score like this. It didn't do that before 3.6. It could spread multiple systems out to fill a page, but not stays within a single system. So orchestra scores prior to 3.6 would have all these ragged bottoms to them that now they won't. So um, in any case, if I go to the instruments dialog, I can add some voices here and I'm gonna add a, a mezzo, I'm gonna add a soprano, a mezzo, a tenor, a baritone, and a bass and a choir, women and men. So I now have a whole lot more instruments in my score and it's compressed the spaces between them so they still fit on the page and it's chosen a place for them which is a traditional place for them which is below percussion and harp but above the strings. That's sort of a common place to put uh, the vocal staves in an orca in a in a in an opera type setting in any any setting that's voices with orchestra they typically go right above the strings why uh, I don't know uh, historical uh, historical reasons or hysterical reason hyster hysterical raisins as uh, yo yo one of uh, our developers sometimes likes to say so um uh. Yeah, so as far as writing for opera, that you know, that's the thing I can tell you is there's how to add your save. Now, how to write for it, there's another matter entirely. I will say, let's go over actually to the open score page. If I go back to here, back to musicscore.com and click on open score, one of the scores that they've produced, and it's enormous, I'm not going to try to load it into MuseScore on my system because it won't handle it while I'm broadcasting. I know that. But I'm going to show you. Here is an actual, uh, well, this is just the vocal score. Is that right then? It says vocal score. Does it only have the voices then, not the instruments? Let's find out. Oh, it's voices plus piano. Um, I'm just scrolling until I find things. So this isn't actually uh, a great example of what an or of what an uh, an opera score would normally look like. It wouldn't just be voices and piano. This is a piano reduction, I guess, or maybe it was actually composed for piano, for all I know, instead of orchestra. But um, in any case, you're going to have voices. You'll have your accompaniment. There's a, a number of issues that come up when you're writing uh, for any. Uh, situation like that, that are sort of musical things to consider. And I touched on this in my newsletter also when I talked about writing in sections and that in a 2T section, all the instruments will basically have the same rhythm. And I kind of showed you a nice trick for doing that in MuseScore. If we look at the music here, uh, you can see that's going on. So here, uh, bum, 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 
bum 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 right um bum 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 is um bum 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 I'm in the wrong key, but that's okay. Um, the uh, melody, if we assume the soprano is the melody, is duplicated here in the piano. And it, it's duplicated an octave higher. And it is, it looks like, throughout that passage. But it's not a given that you will always write that way. In other words, there's no rule, there's no law that says you always want to double your melody in the instruments. But you can see here that it's actually fairly common. But here is a place where maybe that's not happening because uh, the melody here is sustaining a high D and the piano is not sustaining that D. And now we get to this passage. So that passage there. Bum, boom, bum, boom, bum. What's that on top? A cult. C A L what oh that's uh that must be the uh, name of that character in the opera so here you see a melody bum, boo, bum, boo, bum, that is not do doubled in the in the accompaniment there so in this particular opera most of what I've been looking at so far does have that doubled thing going on but here now you can see now we're talking about more of an aria. And now the piano just has accompaniment figures, where it really is just accompaniment, and it's not making any attempt to double what's in the melody. And so those are both valid textures, one in which the accompaniment is really orchestrating a fuller orchestration around what's already going on in the voices, versus this other style where you basically have a, you're establishing what's called a motor rhythm. Those of us who come from the jazz world, we think of that's the rhythm section, you know, a drummer keeping a beat, a bass player playing a, a repeating figure, a rhythm guitar player maybe uh, repeating some rhythm. Well, in an orchestral setting, it or in a piano setting, it might be done by repeating chords like this. In a orchestral setting, it might be some other kind of uh, repeating passage. If I jump over to my 1812, I can probably find places where you find some form of motor rhythm sort of thing going on. Like right here, it's all these uh, tremolo, these eighth notes, basically. The strings are going dun 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 is ba 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 but the strings are going bum 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 and they're keeping a pulse happening so the idea that you know you might give one section your melody while other instruments are dealing with some something that's sort of a pulse and then therefore it's probably going to be repeat repetitive rhythmically so you'll want to use that repitch thing like you could enter this this passage in here and then copy and paste it for as long as you want uh, and then, uh, like if I wanted this to continue, I could select those couple of beats and then repeat them by pressing R, repeat, 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 and then go back and use repitch mode to just enter my pitches, right? So when you have a motor rhythm kind of thing like that, a repeated rhythmic pattern of any kind, you might want to just copy and paste the pattern and then replace the pitches. That can be a, a convenient way of entering things. So um, I don't know. Uh, there's probably other questions that I could answer about. Um, uh, give me one second here. I'm actually expecting a call that I. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to. I, I I was prepared to at some point get the, get a phone call and then have to uh, just put you on autopilot while I um, while I took the call. But in any case, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I think, wrap up fairly soon here. Um, so uh, so there you go. Um, so uh, by all means, you can get me a beefier computer, but if, it's, if, it, uh, if it has a fan, I'm not going to use it. I, I need silent. I need it to fit on my lap, be really super light like this, and have a fan, and have no fan. So there you go. Um, 
So as far as program notes and things like that, Peter is actually quite an expert on that. You can see that he put together some fairly detailed notes in here. And he did it all just using, I mean, sometimes people do that by doing it in a separate program and combining it in PDF. But Peter really enjoys uh, doing that stuff. So let me go back to the 1812 Overture here. He just created this. I mean, this is an image here that he copied and pasted from another program. These are frames. So you can add your own frames to things. I can go in. Where's my uh, my orchestra piece here? I can go in here and in that frame, paste in an image. I can add additional frames. So I can use uh, add frames text frame. And now I have another frame for more text, right? And I can make some of that text be bold using the uh, text toolbar down here. And, you know, you can also make them be multiple frames. Like I think on the 1812, he actually makes every every little section be a separate frame. Yeah, like this paragraph is one frame, and then this paragraph here is a separate frame. And that way he can play with the spacing between them by, by selecting the frame. By the way, when you try to click of, of the text in a frame, it selects the text. If you want to select the underlying frame, control click will then select what's underneath it, except I think I have to get out of edit mode. So let me try that again, control click. Now the frame is selected. And now I can do things like change the gap. There you go. And that's adding space there. So you can do formatting that way. So yeah, there's a lot you can do with frames. You can add uh, multiple pieces of text to a single frame uh, so that you can get multiple columns. And that's uh, you can center text. You can do all sorts of things if you're willing to work at it a little bit. It's not necessarily as convenient as a desktop publishing type program, but it's, um, you know, you can put together some fairly uh, sophisticated uh, notes that way. All right, so I think I'm going to wrap up here. And by all means, though, come back to the community and um, continue the discussion, right? So if I, if I uh, go back to the community page, I've pinned it up to the top. If you come to the conversation uh, section here, new post, just uh, say, hey, let's, uh, you know, I got a, another question about opera or whatever you want. Just uh, come over here and um, would love to just, you know, continue this, continue all the discussions that we're having. So I'm going to uh, wrap up with this. And um, uh, can you copy text if it's just bold and stuff like that? I think maybe that comes in, but it's not going to understand tabs and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, th these uh, other discussions on things, people who do that sort of thing a lot, feel free to uh, continue that discussion over in the conversation area on the, uh, on the community. And uh, with that said, I think I'm going to return to the Musicor Cafe theme here and play out with some music. Give me a moment. Uh -huh. There we go. Well, thank you very much for being here for the MuseCore Cafe today. My name is Mark Sabatella, director of the Mastery MuseCore School. This is the weekly series where we do this. <laughs> we do just what we've been doing every week, talking about making music in MuseCore and all the different techniques, little shortcuts, little tricks, how to solve little thorny problems that you might not have figured out before. I'll be back with more next week. Uh, Thursdays, come back for the uh, Music Masterclass where we talk about more about the musical aspects, more about things like how you might arrange for opera and things like that. So uh, come back to the Music Masterclass. Come join the community. Continue the discussion. Look forward to uh, talking to everyone some more and seeing you next week. Bye.